Hello and welcome back to How to D&D More Good with me, Dread Roberts. And today I've got a friend of mine from LARP who's joining me today. Uh, Daniel, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Hey, very welcome indeed. So, uh, yeah, today we're going to discuss, I guess, we had a couple of little topics we're going to discuss. But first, a question I always tend to ask people is, could you give us a little bit of background on your sort of history and experience with TTRPGs? Yeah, sure. I started playing uh, tabletop games properly uh, around about, I think, in my early 20s. I'd finished university. I'd come back after, funnily enough, studying the games design course and realised that the games industry wasn't for me, so I was trying to decide what to do. A friend of mine invited me down to the local gaming shop because they had a space for a uh, Scion game, which was the World of Darkness or White Wolf one where you play demigods, which yes. was around the time American Gods had just come out, so a lot of people had started playing it got involved in that. The game was my introduction, then we started playing a couple of other different games over the years in that group. Funnily enough, never actually played D&D through that group apart from a Spelljammer campaign using homebrewed second dead rules for eight years before it kind of filtered out. And then recently, well, I say recently, when it came out, Fifth Ed got picked up by us, played the first campaign, really enjoyed it, and then lockdown hit, I got really involved in joining other games. And yeah, I've been playing in Fifth Ed games wherever I can find them. Did you find that with the, the advent of lockdown, I found this, uh, it, actually being able to just do it online with people all over the country, is, I know it's not quite as good as sitting around a table, but at least you get to do it. <laughs> yeah, so my my Monday game, we were playing in person, we were playing uh, we were playing Ghosts of Salt Marsh, but using Eberron, our DM basically merged the two <coughs> together. We started that just a week or two before lockdown, so we switched to playing on Fancy Grounds on Discord, realised, oh, this online thing works, and then a mm-hmm. bunch of LARP friends, because we weren't able to have events... We start playing D anD D, so I played a couple of them over that. It was nice to stay in touch with folk, play games with people I couldn't normally outside of Sheffield, mm-hmm. and yeah, I think the most longest running campaigns I'm in now are the ones <coughs> run by people I know through LARP, and they're my kind of go to ones. I've done play by text on Discord where you don't even have to be sound; you just type your response and use a dice roller. I've done oh, face to face on cams. Yeah, that that was an interesting. I one, haven't that tried was a that. Good chance to- it, you kind of have to remind the fast typers to slow down for the slow typers, almost like a. But yeah, it was it was an experience I wouldn't have had outside lockdown, and it's a, it's a different way to play D anD D, but you can get a bit more role play based because you type what you're doing, your dialogue can be more. You can put emphasis in where you can't, and you can play characters you might not be as comfortable playing out loud because you're not having to put a voice on for it. Nice. So uh, that's pretty cool, actually. So today we were gonna. I'm, I'm moving this this one around. I've actually got the mic here. This this is pretty much useless. <laughs> no so t- today we were gonna discuss. Then we decided. So uh, first off, how to design good character concepts, and I, I know that I understand that's quite a broad topic. So we're gonna touch on that a little bit, and then we're gonna talk about how to play as a good group player. Which I think me as the sort of I've been DMing now for like 22 years. So oh, like nice. a long time, yeah, and, and playing for a long time as well. Not in the same campaign, obviously. That'd be <laughs> that'd be bonkers. But yeah, it'd be it's, impressive uh, though. I, I very rarely play anymore. I do get the odd game in, but it's really nice to get that sort of player's perspective. So mm-hmm. yeah, so designing a good character concept. I mean, this doesn't have to stick just to D and D. I know D and D is probably the system most people play, but you know we can kind of talk. It's probably good, like if you've got experience with different systems and, and different games within systems, sorry, different, uh, what's the word, settings within systems. Yeah. No, I'm happy to sort that. I, I, Fifth Ed is kind of my main focus now, but yeah, I've played all sorts of stuff, and uh, usually just for like short three, four month campaigns where we did the classic, we'll play a game on a rotation, then we'll say, we'll come back to this one when we play something new, and then we never come back to it because we always play something new instead, but because of that, I did generate a lot of characters over my time, and I think my biggest one is, and this is a did for D&D as well, is I have, I, I think it was Ginny D, the person online who does a lot of D&D yes. tips, she did a video on design a character wrong intentionally, and that actually I started thinking about it, because there is always that talk about optimised characters, and mm. obviously I'm not saying don't play an optimised character if you want, but sometimes build a character that is not the standard you know pick a race and a class that you don't expect to go together and see how you can come up with it and you can come up with and there is always the classic idea of sometimes everyone wants to be the most unique thing at the table and yes. I'm, I'm saying this who joined a game thinking with the plays playing the supposed token human of the party to start with who was secretly a dampier and a lycanthrope because <laughs> i'd figured out how to play it the dm said that's ridiculous go for it but it was worth it for when the players actually worked out what i was 
and then worked out what I was the second time, and it was a chance to play something different. But you can make just as interesting a character with a human fighter than you can the whatever most newest races they've got in an Earth Arcana across with whatever homebrew class you find online. Hmm. You just have to find the ways to do it. The thing I found that's really been helping me, especially with D&D, is actually use the background. Because I find the backgrounds for fifth-head characters are woefully... A lot of games I've played in don't come in unless you've got something like the Outlander one, or whichever one it is that lets you find rations for the party or yeah. lets you retrace steps. If it's not got a mechanical benefit, I can't remember a lot of games where it got used, but I found sometimes picking them up and just actually using them and the suggested bonds and such. Mm. Like that said, character who was the vampire part, werewolf part, so and so. A lot of that came from looking at the class, the background, and the race having the random die things i just went oh if i use this 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 and this together there's a sequence of events that i can build a backstory from okay. and a reason to play a character like that and also yeah make your negative stats a part of the character mm. i've found actually playing a character who I, I i tend to be someone who defaults to the high charisma characters so i'll yeah. play your bards i'll play warlocks never played a paladin but it's on my list too but it, they're very role players being very upfront talky characters hmm. i'm playing a charisma 8 character for the first time and i'm having a lot of fun playing a character who's <clears> not <throat> sure of himself and because he's got the haunted one background i can justify it to that he's not low charisma because he's you know ugly or because he's not you know confident he's hmm. got low charisma because he's seen some shit pardon my language <laughs> and he's yeah, got it, the it, idea of it's, yeah. it's an adult channel you can say whatever you want <laughs> That's fair. Side effect of uh, always having to double check around uh, customer service work. But it's that logic of the background makes people uncomfortable around you, so I build it into make charisma the low stat, mm. but actually make that. And it just a lot of the character personality formed in play, but you just have to go and pick those traits. And I've got character ideas for picking monks who were base, races based off being very slow and lumbering, not quick and nimble. I think mm. I, for a friend's one shot, generated a Goliath artificer because Goliaths <laughs> are usually barbarian. I think yeah, it, was yeah, yeah. it was it was an armor artificer because I was like, what do I do to actually play a mech in D and D? Obviously, <laughs> on the, nowadays, Warforged hmm. is your kind of go to. Yeah. but I yeah, had that no logic problem. of hang on, Goliath gets in large and armor. That was that main <laughs> stuff, so I can literally turn into <laughs> yeah. a giant. Okay, I grew on up the, on Transformers. Uh, this was my hmm. logic. On the Sorry. on the on the background thing, I, I've put. A, I don't know if it's a if it's in the book or not. It's just a sort of homebrew homebrew rule of fan. If the character is going to roll something which is relevant to their background, I just give them advantage on it. So you know, we had somebody hmm. with a no, with a noble background that wanted to do a history check on heraldry. We can see some soldiers in the distance. Can I recognise their flags? Can I recognise the standards? I'm like, you've got the noble background. You can have advantage on your history roll because you know that sort of stuff. I like. I like, like that, yeah, like leaning into it as a DM mm. and a player are both great ways to do it. Like, mm. I, again, like my Tuesday game where I play that character, the Haunted One stuff has been used. The ability of how people react to you, the DM does have people do that. They're friendly around my character, but they're sort of aware there's something off. Uh, another game where I played, same thing with Noble, the position of privilege background, do, I will sometimes say to the DM, I in the text-based game, I'll just type, I'm going to use this, type how I act to them, the DM will affect how the NPC reacts in accordance in that a yeah the npcs will react according to the background because yeah there, there's nothing worse than picking a skill and then getting it just get ignored it's like it's or you never get the chance to sort of utilize it properly <laughs> yeah it's like playing a character who get who gets a swim speed and then the dm say great we're running an entirely <laughs> desert based campaign yeah. do you, or, do you, you find you have a fly speed so do, do you find it easier when you create a character if if you know the campaign setting first, even if it's a homebrew one, or or, or is it can it be fun if you just go? Because I was in a game recently where it's, you can literally play whatever you want. That mm. like, anything feeds into this world, so you can play anything. Like you know, have you been in those situations? And if so, which one do you find easiest? I uh, yeah, I've had both recently. So I've had <coughs> I mean, well, not I've necessarily easiest, I've... but you know, more fun or more rewarding, I guess. Hmm. I I find personally, I work best if I know some basic ground rules. If I know for a fact that. You can play this race, but just be aware that this race might be treated a certain way, mm. or you know this race isn't is off the cards because it's not part of the law. Or you can play this, just be aware that if you do it, it gives me an idea of like, yeah, what is the in-game view of this race? What law is there? Like, 
I, I will gush about the Tuesday game because Lauren has so much stuff. She has an enti- she's been running in this world for ages. She's got a full like lore guide in Roll Twenty, hmm. so she can just say to a new player here, look through this, see what a race is, anything that appeals to you. So I had a look at some stuff. I picked a region. That's good. I'm running for another game where I had a concept. I went to the DM and said, right, I want to play this. And the DM came back to me for that one and go, ah, uh, you can't actually do that because this race isn't actually able to be this mm. class. And I was like, hmm. hindsight should have asked first, but at least I hadn't gen the character. So yeah, I prefer to know a bit because I, I tend to, I like having building blocks to build up on, build a mm. structure and then have like a concept and then go see how it develops and play. If I'm building completely from scratch, I can sometimes take longer to get a feel. And I also lapse into... Not murder hobo, but chaos monkey is probably how I yes. call the character. Yeah, they they're less a character; they're more an excuse for me to just do something and see what happens. Yeah. Whereas if I've got something to build off and connect myself to the setting, I definitely find mm. I become more role play based mm. and knowing what I'm getting myself because it gets like session. It's like a mini session zero. You know what the setting's tone is. You're not going to turn up playing comedy relief character in a grim Dark Souls game. <laughs> when everyone's being super you know serious. But yeah, yeah. Only, well, you can do that, but as long as you know that your character is probably not going to have a good time of it and you plan to have them maybe become more serious, mm. you can do it. Where if you're going to go in and you're still in the middle of the somber art moment, you're cracking jokes and then getting annoyed when someone you know either tells you to shut up or kicks you, you've no one but yourself to blame sort of thing. So yeah, know your know your audience and feel the room are always definitely good bits of uh, info for character building. I find. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. How do you, how do you feel about the uh, the Tasha's stuff? The Tasha's corner of everything rules, which just gives you a little bit more flexibility on the because you you're talking about building the sort of characters that you wouldn't normally get. You know, kind of mm. like you said, the, the whole Goliath artificer thing is. Yeah, so custom lineage and the ability to adjust your stats for race. I really think they're a step, mm. they're a good step and. Yeah, they, they kind of take away some of the race's uniqueness, which I can see where some people said, but also they kind of take away the stereotyping. So I think yeah. it's the, the positives outweigh the negatives, and it you can still play the race as written. You just can adjust it if you want. It's like you can go custom lineage. For the game I mentioned where the concept didn't work, we found mm. using custom lineage, I was able to make something that was an approximation of what I wanted that fit the setting. So I, I, mean, I quite like it where you've got a bit of uh, freedom to adjust the stats because... Especially if you use like a point by your standard array, mm. you can then look and go, okay, I can either put everything into this one stat or I can have an even a spread. You're not as limited. Like, say you want to play, you want to try playing something like, like when I played the Darmpier, I wanted to play a Darmpier because I read about them in Van Richten's, I really liked them. Mm-hmm. And their lineages, which are like the new things. So mixing that with the Tashers, I was able to assign the stats to get what would be a decent spread. And not so much min max, but get a character who at least was good enough at what he'd need to be, but not be useless at everything. But mm. you know, he's got stuff he can do, he's got stuff he can't do, and I'm not literally playing a character who, when we're out of combat, is just sit there going, "Can I hit something yet?" <laughs> yeah. I don't have any always, other skills. <laughs> it's always good to have, always good to have skills outside of combat, even if you're mm. playing a thumb monkey. I found because it gets you a reason to interact. So mm. yeah, I, I quite like the Tasha's changes and. They're optional ones, so yeah. If you don't like them, you don't have to use them. But I'm a big fan of them. You you mentioned something too. I mean, on, on that, I completely agree with you on that topic. I'm very mm-hmm. similar thoughts. The only difference is I the custom line, lineage feels a little bit yeah. OP, and I tend to play with a lot of power gamers who've been playing D and D for many many years. So I, I, I don't. I, think... I, I like them having powerful characters, but only if the whole squad is a powerful squad. So you know, I can balance the encounters a bit easier. Yeah, I think because custom lineage is basically playing a variant human, but you choose what they look like. Is how I've kind of read it. Because yeah, variant human of... with dark vision, and that's uh... well, yeah, you, well, dark vision or a skill proficiency. Yeah, because oh, right, it's a yeah. trait. You yeah, because I had a look at that myself. Because it's you basically you either lose gaining extra skill proficiencies to get dark vision, or you can gain an extra proficiency. So I, I've had to actually look at this because, funnily enough, the Dampier character in game is currently looking at getting cured of his vampirism and it's like Mm -hmm. I'm sat there going I'm giving up a lot of actual mechanical benefits but it's right for the character Mm. but at the same time and the DM basically said yeah you'd either probably become regular human variant human custom lineage so I had a look and saw how close to the original stats could I get this would it be a complete change and I was looking at yeah variant human and custom lineage are as you say you're basically you're a variant human who loses a skill proficiency for dark vision and you basically have a your your stat increases is a plus two instead of a plus two plus ones mm. so yeah it's 
it's not uh, the way I think it becomes OP is if you start abusing the feats. But yeah, special. Yeah. I think part of that is also depending on what with new feats and power creep. And there's always a DM can always just say if you want to play custom lineage, that's fine. Just be aware that feats you pick can't have a stat increase, mm. or you say you can pick feats, but they've got to be ones i have to approve because you know if you pick a character whose custom lineage is strict haven initiate feet and you're oh, not no, no. a strict haven game <laughs> no, like yeah like it, that's, exactly that's it, i mean it's as a yeah exactly like, like that feat is designed for a specific setting mm. i'm playing in a strict haven camp well i'm playing in a campaign <clears throat> using strict haven but in the dm's own homebrew yeah, yeah because she has a wizard school wizard college that actually fits the game mechanic and i did feel a bit guilty asking to take that background that gave the feat mm. but my view was I, my character it's, it's, ju- it's justified in that scenario yeah it's uh, yeah it's completely and I justified did check, i i didn't realize the other players weren't taking it at the time but mm. i kind of was like well if i take this i'm losing out on gaining additional abilities elsewhere mm. i gain an extra spell that i'm playing a sorcerer so i've got a limit mm. also because it's D beyond they've not quite patched in the clockwork soul sorcerer i couldn't actually swap spells out as i leveled as right. i was supposed to because they've they've not actually implemented because of the nature of how some of the newer subclasses work if because we're, we're playing on D beyond i was like mm, i can't do that but it means i'm kind of bouncing out but at the same time a lot of it is also i tend to overthink cause there is that part of my brain that worries <laughs> and goes "Ooh, are they just gonna think i'm min maxing but at the same time someone once said well you know min maxing a power gaming isn't inherently bad it's just as long as you're still a fun to play character so i'm trying to get into that mindset instead now i hmm, agree yeah agree with that one it's yeah it's there's definitely a fine line isn't there I'm, I'm, i'll be honest i'm I, and i'm not a power gamer but i do like to make very optimized characters just is mm. just I, I just find it fun I, you know I, I like the character who can do like 80 damage criticals at level five <laughs> it's like i don't go too far with it but a character who can't do anything isn't fun. Like you can no. have the role play benefits of a character who is bad at something and grows as they level, but mm. yeah, you want to still have fun and feel useful in a battle or in a social situation because yeah, it's that fight like if you're going for pure character who's useless at everything, you kind of almost take yourself away and you deprive yourself of fun. And if you go yeah. for a character who can the trick I think someone said is just try not to be a one man band, because you know, it is yes. a team sport like you know some mm. people used to say that a bard if overly done could do a bit of everything and it's like well a bard can do a bit of everything but not as good as everything you're like the ultimate supporter so if your cleric's down you take over as healer if your wizard's down you take over as a caster mm. if your other social is down but you're never going to be like you know everyone it, I, I always love the full version of the jack of all trades quote because i used for ages didn't know the second half mm. of the quote mm. i just knew jack of all trades master of none and then it was that moment of someone said, you know, the second line is better than a master of one. And it's like, oh, okay, a character who's a bit good at everything, you've got something to do. Mm-hmm. But, but at the same time, yeah, a character who's useless at everything, that's no fun to anyone. You're just sat there constantly getting knocked down and you're making death saves and you may as well just <laughs> go, hmm, I've, not, I, I've done characters where I've kind of gone a bit random and realised afterwards I could have built this better. Yeah, and sometimes they're fun. Sometimes you're sat there, and at the same time, if you talk to a DM, you can always re-roll or restart yeah, that's, character. That's the thing. Mo- <laughs> most DMs well. understand this quite well. I hope. I hope anyway. The, do, the, the DM do, wants you l- to have us fun too. Yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely, absolutely. He's, uh, you're the, the, there to facilitate that. Obviously, uh, I mean, I enjoy. I love DMing. I, I really enjoy it. But yeah, it's all that. Uh, afterwards, I'm very conscious. Of, did everyone else enjoy it as well? You know, the, 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 the bits I could have done better. I, I was looking on my phone. You sent me. You, you said something about a character test. I was trying to find it, but I couldn't. Oh, the lift test. Lift test. Well, what, what was that the about? Lift test. <laughs> so that comes from a term. It actually came from a LARP discussion I had, where a and it, it kind of translates for LARP and tabletop as easily. And it's the. It came across because there was a quote I saw someone once put on Facebook, which was the don't just play a character who's fun to play, play a character who's fun to play with. Because you'd, it, it was kind of a rebuttal to that everyone knows the classic, oh, well, it's what my character would do. Hmm. And you could still be a character where you're acting true to your character and it's inconvenient to the party in a way that's still enjoyable for the rest of the party to have. As opposed to just turn up and play a dick that everyone doesn't like. And it's like, at LARP... <clears throat> and we've, we've all seen people... that so many times. <laughs> yeah, and you can see, there are people who have turned up who have played someone who's just been a git. But mm. then there's someone who turns up and plays being a git in a way that you enjoy bouncing off them. Yes. And that was the kind of idea. And I think the idea I had was, the lift test was... I think the quote came and it was uh, based off of, from a friend of mine in the cosplay scene after a lot of people were 
but there was a bit of a thing where Deadpool cosplayers were getting a bit too into the anonymity and running around being troublemakers. And I think the mm-hmm. phrase was, yeah, you wouldn't want to be stuck in a lift with Deadpool. <laughs> and that's the lift and it test. Was like, <laughs> uh, the lift test is, would you want what to be yeah, would you want to be stuck in a lift with your character? That's kind of how I came about. And even no. if your character is an absolute git, you could still do them in a way that you as a person could put up with them for that time. And that it started off as a kind of a simple thing, but it, it's not like saying, oh, only play a likable character. Well, you can still play a character who is likable OC, even if in character they're a total po- toss pot. Yeah. And like I, I've kind of... And also, you know, be... The, the response to it's what my character would do, the follow-up to that was, no one is making you play that character but you. Yes, oh, very true. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because I, I have seen some people who have not done... Because it's what my character would do can be used by some people to justify any behaviour they want to get away with. Mm. But there are, I think, people who use that because they almost feel trapped because they've made a character and they kind of feel that they have to do it in a certain way to be true to the character. And there is that mindset of your character can change. Like I've I've done it in tabletop, I've done it in LARP, I've played characters, I've realised I'm not enjoying it as much. Mm. So I've just gone, okay, I'm going to have my character's view on this subject change, they're mm-hmm. going to be this, so... Character I've development. Character. You don't actually make an arc out of it. <laughs> exactly. You you Change choose the direction. The, but yeah, you choose how your arc goes. So I'm the low charisma character. He's becoming a lot more self confident. But because I, I did realize early on, he talks a lot, and there was that insensitive. Yeah, as someone who talks a lot, it's easy to be the spotlight hog and do it in a way mm. where you're taken away from other players. But it was easy. So I do a deliberate effort now of times where I'll just take him off screen to let other, make sure other people can mm. do stuff. I'll say like, oh, I'll go look for the supplies and means I'm away. F-. Instead of doing the let's go follow me, it's like when the stereotype of the rogue who goes off and has their own solo adventure all the time. It can mm. just as easily be the rogue goes, oh, I'll go do a bit of a scout. Uh, DM, just tell me a role and stay with the camp or something like that. I've that kind of brings it on quite nicely, actually, doesn't it? To to, to discussing sort of yeah, how to do things well as part of a t- like how to actually be a good part of a team player. Because mm. like, I think I think LARP's very different to tabletop because LARP there's so many people around and you're you're kind of pay, you're there to make your own story as it goes. Yes. But on the tabletop, when you when you're with the same small group, because at LARP you know there's thousands of people. If someone if if you're not getting on with somebody, you can just walk away and join any of the other thousands of people. Whereas if you're in the exactly. same tabletop group every week, every two weeks with the same four, five, six people, yeah, kind of that you have you have to have a reason the party keeps your character around, even if you're like if you're going to play a character who is just constantly betrays the party or won't help or does something. Mm. If it's what your character would do, then what their characters would do is ditch you and go hire someone <laughs> else. It's the yeah. A yeah. friend of mine's description of Lord of the Rings was uh, Lord of the Rings would never work as a D&D game because no one wants to go talk to the broody bugger in the corner at the bar. Yes. <laughs> Only because you have to. And, yeah, Aragorn uh, would definitely be an NPC. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously everyone character. forgets that. Uh, everyone forgets Aragorn's doing it as an act. He then turns up and pops. Yeah, because he then actually pops up as himself mm. later. But if you're there playing the sort of I'm just going to sulk and not do anything, then that's great. You're not giving the rest of the party stuff to do. So you... and it. It is uh, how to be part of the party is, yeah, how to actually play with everyone else. And like I say, you have to be fun to play with as well as fun to play. It's like session zero, obviously, always important. Uh, mm. A thing that Lauren, the DM for Tuesday, does, which I love and I'm totally stealing for future games, is there's a thing called the Circle of Trust, which mm-hmm. is a document where you can talk to them direct and say, I'm not a fan of this. Can we avoid this? So say you've got a phobia, say you've got a subject that you'd rather avoid. Like as me as an example, uh, random phobia I've got, I have marinthophobia. I have a phobia of being tied up. So mm-hmm. if our characters are ever captured, I usually just let a DM know in a game and say, just don't go into X, don't go into mm. detail on the restraints because I w- might start getting a bit agitated. Mm. And if the DM notices me getting a bit nervous, they'll check and say, Daniel, are you okay? I'm like, it's fine. Just carry on. Just uh move forward it's it's a weird little phobia but it's the same as how some people obviously like at larp i you know me at larp i play a jester Mm -hmm. i deliberately make my face makeup i avoid anything that looks clown like because i don't want to set anyone who's got cholerophobia off i Mm -hmm. actually changed the original makeup plan was a lot more clown like for that character so i've gone for something different it's the same as a character with a backstory playing a character who's got a quite tragic backstory who was basically he was captured and tortured for part of his backstory i checked with the dm and said don't tell me who but has anyone in the party said this is an issue and if so mm. i'll avoid discussing it 
same with like uh, that sort of logic. There, there is stuff that we can put publicly. There's ground rules in the document, but also the DM has a private one that they can just say, just so you know, person X in our group isn't a fan of this. I'm not going to say who. That's as an example. Like I'm not obviously yeah, yeah, going to yeah. say what anyone said. I'll just say what I've fed, I've listed. But that works as a great way of establishing boundaries and letting mm-hmm. each know. And if in doubt, talk to your DM and say if you're struggling with something like i've had dms talk to me about stuff i've done that's made it difficult for the players and i can mm. then change based off that and yeah be if a dm you, feeds you, something you, back you've got to, to you. be very open haven't you to this but it's sort of as a dm and a player because i i've had to speak mm. to people before not that you not that you ever want to but i've had seen you know, that that was a little bit close to the bone for someone can we just sort of dial that back next time and i've had people who yeah. didn't Oh well, if they don't like it, they shouldn't be in the group. It's like, no, don't be like this. Come on, we're all friends Ex- here. Like, <laughs> exactly. If someone tells me that's something I did they didn't like, it's like, mm. what do I lose saying? Okay, I'll try to avoid doing that instead. If you say, oh, well, they shouldn't be in the group, you're basically taking an ex- needlessly confrontational attitude. All you it's just, yeah, it's say- exclusionary, isn't it? And especially given the yeah. fact that you can you can jump on roll twenty and there is probably a group for everything. There are probably some. There mm. are probably groups of like you know extreme kind of adult topics. And yeah, join those groups. They'll, be, they'll probably be more than happy to have somebody like uh, that. But. Exactly. Like, like I'm, I'm someone who's not always great with sexual matter in a game. I will always be upfront and say this can sometimes make me uncomfortable if mm. we cannot go into detail. Because I mean, we all know of these. I it's a stereotype online, but I don't know how many people have ever actually played in a game with someone being that. But it is the the quote unquote horny bard trope where someone will go and try yeah. to flirt with every NPC, and even then a DM could just say, "Okay, that happens." Anyway, while you're doing that, we'll cut back to you. Yeah, that's, and it's that's... like fate, fate, <laughs> anyway, fate while that's like, like, happening. <laughs> and it's like you, it is possible to play a character like that and be mm. respectful. Like we we had a discussion in a different Discord of a player who was thinking it was his first time playing a character of a different gender to him he was going to play a femme presenting character who Mm -hmm. was going to be sexually promiscuous because i think he had a plan for a character based off something he liked but he was saying i'm actually a bit self-conscious because me being a bloke this could come across as i'm taking the piss and there was a few of us discussing people of various uh, identities and giving mm-hmm. their views on it and it was explained that ultimately it's like well don't play a promiscuous character play a character who happens to be promiscuous yes and that is a yeah, quote yeah, yeah, from yeah, the yeah, yeah. the york university <clears throat> larp society kind of popularized the quote don't play x play a character trying to be x and i'm very much of that mm. don't play a, don't play x character play a character who x is a traitor there's so yes like, I, x is a, x play, is a behavior they exhibit sometimes yeah it doesn't have to <laughs> not, define not a defi- them, yeah it's not a defining characteristic of their sort of being and ultimately, also know that no feel the room. Like if you're still trying to flirt with the lich while one of your party is bleeding to death on the ground, no. Like I, <laughs> the play by tech, the play by text game, I did the same. I'm playing a promiscuous uh, bard who is a different gender to mine because I don't have to do the voice because I'm not that good at doing voices of uh, <clears throat> people who aren't a six foot three Yorkshire guy. <laughs> I'm trying it now with a different Discord because I'm trying to do it for mannerisms and accents. So I'm not trying to put on a. So I don't want it to come across as insulting, but playing it as a text-based character the first time was a bit easier, but it was very much played as, yes, this character will flirt when it's their downtime. If we're on an adventure, they're working, and it was a good way of establishing. Mm. Also, we had the fun of having a person playing a child in the party. Our wizard was a tiny gnome child who didn't understand things, but happened to have full wizard fireball <clears throat> powers. So we had the a lot of comedy would come from... Uh, about to say something, pause, not in front of the kid. And that was, <laughs> I found, a good way of playing off to the group. I mm. didn't have to make myself uncomfortable by putting stuff that I didn't like. I could play a character who was outside my comfort zone, but because, A, it actually reacts to the fact that they were playing a child, <clears throat> as opposed to just treat them like an adult adventurer, mm. a lot... <clears throat> oh, big pun. <laughs> like, a bummed. lot of us would actually do stuff like... Uh, we had the big half-orc rogue who was quite aggressive to everyone, but was actually quite soft to the child. Mm. We had the other characters who were a bit like, deep breath, they're just a kid. And it would actually include, it was acknowledging character choices. Nice. And I think that is also, yeah, take an interest in the rest of the party stuff and don't talk, you know, I, I, I'll occasionally sometimes react where I've had like, oh, you're from this area, my character's from this area too. It, yeah, it can. If I do it wrong, I make it about my character. It's trying to find common ground. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you, you. I've just thought about the the whole thing with sort of the common ground and, and 
learning what the other characters can do. See, I, I've come, and it links into what you were saying about the like broody one in the corner who someone wouldn't come to, but it's the opposite of that. So the kind of character who's got full on hero syndrome. Often it's often, no, to be honest, it's the player usually more than the character. But they yes. they want to talk to every NPC. They want to have like first decision. You know, they want to run everything past them. I've definitely played with people who who are like the un- unelected group leader and, and really want that yes. to be their way. And, and I find that sometimes is more challenging to kind of manage than uh, someone who kind of wants to be a dark broody character. Because, you know, the dark broody character, you just you, you can link them in via other means. It's harder to link someone out. Like, have, you, you know, have you, have you ever kind of come across that sort of... I, I've come across and I probably am um, in my in my years playing I'll probably I'll put my hand up and say I've probably been that player before okay. before I had to because yeah and yeah I'm, I'm 37 now I've been playing D&D since I was in my early 20s so I've had time You're to check a year I'm older than me good sir <laughs> It, time, time is a weird soup at this point. I've learned age is a relative concept, and, uh, especially having spending a time in a job where I deal with people who are older than me and should know better and sat there <laughs> going oh my god this person gets anyway that's a and neither here nor there but yeah i've with a player who wants to be the one who does everything it can be tricky because sometimes you do it if you're in a group where everyone if people are quiet and like me being a quite anxious person i sometimes feel compelled to fill the silence sometimes i have to remind myself you can just not say anything and let things move to the next scene i definitely found playing a character who is actively trying to be a leader is something that more works if you have a chat with the party you're also just you know don't if the person says no yeah, be willing to just don't take a my way or the highway approach because that mm. can definitely be a problem. Because if you're, like I say, if you're the unelected leader, some people can get into that role because they're just naturally got the charisma. Some people wind up in that role because they naturally wind up being the one person who's happy to do it. It's like being the person who ends up keeping track of the party loot. Mm. Every game has someone but, who yeah. tends to be party accountant. Mm. I mean, you can't. But, you yeah, also if, can't. You can't knock it as well because if someone's really engaged at that level, it means they're enjoying the game. So you know, the, you, you can't. Mm. You, you kind of. You can't be angry at somebody who's who's just really yeah. engaged. <laughs> but, yeah. Sometimes you know, if you're a DM, the best thing to do is just have mm. a chat with them and just say, "Look, appreciate what you're doing, but just rein it in a little, just to give everyone else a chance to get involved." Mm. Sometimes you're doing good. Just, uh, just you know, keep the keen in control. And again, it's we've probably seen it. In LARP sometimes you've had to just sometimes tell someone else in the group just we appreciate what you're doing but just for your own benefit you'll enjoy it more if you pull back and actually let other people do stuff mm. too don't burn yourself out and I think that's another thing is yeah make it clear to them they can it because if they're trying to be in charge all the time and it doesn't go their way it could be quite disheartening whereas if they're playing mm. as you know part of the group like yeah group leader is a tricky one especially when it's when you've got two people trying to be the group leader that it can be tricky I'd- I kind of found that I can solve that with with puzzles sometimes. So you know, if there's kind of different puzzles or obstacles, as the DM, you can Mm. if one character feels that they haven't really engaged much in that session, I'll specifically engineer a scenario where their skill set or their knowledge or that character's experience Mm. will be relevant to solving the task. So they kind of have to defer to that character, and it's hard to do. But you know, and it's it's much easier if you've got a small group. When I played a a, a campaign Mm. with like eight players, and it was just impossible. Never playing that many again ever. Like six is my maximum now. Five five to seven mm, is the golden mm, number. Five to six, mm. seven. If you've got someone who's happy to play a support role, I found can work out quite well. Mm, Sit in the background. So um, it's it's been amazing chatting to you. Unfortunately, we're we're very nearly out of time. So uh, I mean, thank you so so much for having this conversation. It's. uh, Always have to do so. I feel like we, should, a, we, yeah, we could, we, we could probably do like another hour at least. I imagine, but so <laughs> before we go though, uh, so I kind of asked the, the the last couple I've done sort of asked like if if you've got any good advice for people sort of wanting to get into the hobby, uh, ways of kind of mm. engaging easier, ways of having more fun from it, or even ways of getting started. You know, are, are there any sort of good tips you know or that you've been told to kind of get people into what's what I think is a really cool hobby? Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's a B if you wanted to try and find places to go play D online as you say there's a lot more opportunities but if you can do it with friends first that's always good because you've got that ability to have the discussion but if you are going to go join the game have a chat establish what you want don't just assume every game is going to be the same because that'll always be the issue if you go in you play your first game and you want it to and i think ultimately my advice to a lot of hobbies is always manage your expectations going in because if you've gotten into it through like you know seeing a live stream of an established group who've played for ages together you joining a bunch of people playing a casual game might be a very different thing Mm. Uh, different doesn't always mean bad is always the other thing i always uh, feel is good advice and ultimately remember it is a game you're there to have fun if you're not enjoying it 
you can always go find somewhere else but talk to and always communicate and talk to each other like adults if it's not going to happen that way don't feel as bad going somewhere else but ultimately try and actually find somewhere that suits you and uh yeah have fun i know it's a cliche but you're, you're going to have fun it's a game and the other one i always say is don't don't be afraid to let your character develop in play don't feel you've got to turn up with the perfectly written a backstory fully the full, yeah oh you. yeah the, the two-page the, backstory because the, the dm will go i am going to ignore that can you give me like two paragraphs and then i'll include the, the, that in the game <laughs> Mod, mod, there is nothing wrong with modular backstory, as I call it, a.k.a. Mm. making shit up as you go along. Yes, absolutely. So, Daniel, thank you so, so much for talking to me today. I, I re- pr- to really it. appreciate it. Nice one. Uh, for everyone else, do, do, like and subscribe if you want to. There's going to be more of these coming out. Uh, just generally just me talking to talking to friends and people I know about how to do D&D more good. So from us, I'm being Dread Roberts. See you all later. Bye-bye-bye-bye.